Hello, I'm Philipp Geisler. Welcome to one of the virtual events of Berlin's 20th International Literature Festival. You see my guest and me in small framed video panels, and there could maybe not be a more suitable forum to talk with him. He's the creator of the graphic novel New Kid, a New York Times bestseller and winner of the Coretta Scott King Author Award and the Kirkus Prize for Young Readers Literature. New Kid is also the first graphic novel to ever win the Newbery Medal and will soon have a companion, the graphic novel Class Act, which of course we will speak about as well. He's known for his uh, award-winning comic strip Mama's Boys, which was syndicated to the City Sun and other weekly papers across the United States for over 18 years. And he's the co-founder of the Schomburg's annual Black Comic Book Festival. It's my great pleasure to speak with a cartoonist and author illustrator who the writer Kwame Alexander recently affectionately labeled a vampire painter who's got moxie. Welcome, Jerry Craft. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. It's my um, pleasure. It's great to have you with us, Jerry. And I think we should maybe explain the vampire story, first of all. <laughs> you know, um, Kwame is quite the um, wordsmith. <laughs> <laughs> You know, so sometimes he tells the best story. Sometimes I don't even know where those things come from. So I may have to actually ask him with that. But um, I I know that I speak to him pretty often now, which mm. is great. Mm. And I, when I first met him, I he was up on stage talking and I was just actually mesmerized. And this is right. before I had read any of his books. Uh, but the vampire one, that, that's, uh, that's new to me, so I have to ask him when I go. I'll help you to remember, I think he was hinting to your nocturnal work rhythms. Um, oh, because okay. I think you're somebody who kind of works at night a lot, right? Yes. So, you know what's so funny? Um, I have always liked working at night. When I was younger, my dad used to um, work nights at the post office. And he wouldn't leave until 11 o'clock at night. So I would like to spend as much time as I could with him. Mm. And then when he'd go to work, I was like, okay, well, now I'm going to get to work and I'll do my homework or whatever. So I've just always been nocturnal. Mm. And I know when I was finishing up class act recently, I think I would start at eight o'clock at night. And there were times where I would, say, okay, it's time to go to bed. And I'd look and the sun was coming out and I had literally stayed up the entire night. Um, I just love it because I don't have to worry about, you know, emails and texts and, you know, checking sports scores and any of that stuff. It's just really like a hyper focus uh, that I absolutely really love. So I'm glad that's what he was talking about. Right, right, right. It wasn't <laughs> anything bad. <laughs> uh, so, so, I mean, as you hinted to, and he did as well, these kind of work habits, mainly it or originally had to do with your father's work with them when, when you were a kid. Um, mm -hmm. I was thinking, what was family for you as you grew up, may, may I ask? Sure. So my family uh, was my mom and dad. And uh, my brother and sister were nine and 10 years older than me. Mm -hmm. So in a way it was a family, but in a way I was an only child because you know, there's a big difference between uh, a 19 and 20 year old and an eight year old than it was if we were all eight, nine, 10, 11. Mm -hmm. um, so being that my dad worked nights, he was home with me during the day. So I spent a lot of time with him. And that was when I really started getting into comic books. And then, you know, we would go to comic conventions since he was there during the day or, you know, going to the local comic shop and, you know, drawing. And then he would go to sleep mm -hmm. because he would have to get up at 10 o'clock p.m. And then he would literally work from I would I think he did like the midnight shift, midnight to 8 a.m. And then when I would leave for school, he would just be coming home. Uh, and then my mom worked long hours. So I did spend a lot of time by myself in the house, but I had a great group of friends. So a lot of the stuff from New Kid, where he's got his friends from around his block or, you know, friends from his school, like a lot of that is based on my own personal experience. And in fact, I used a lot of their names uh, from my friends growing up in the book. Did you know your grandparents well? I did not. Um, so whenever I do a grandfather, that's always my dad. Right. Um, 
I only ever met one of my grandparents, and that is my father's father. But I never met either of my mother's parents nor my father's biological mom. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, and and here, and especially, I would say in the African American community, the grandmother has such a like high sense of like royalty almost, you know, and I always had friends, oh yeah, you know, I'm going to my grandmother's house or I'm going down south to visit my grandmother or I'm doing this with my grandmother. And I just didn't have that. I didn't have a Mm -hmm. lot of family like that. Um, So I had my immediate family and a lot of friends and, you know, some aunts and uncles who were cool, Mm -hmm. but also spread out across the U.S. So Mm -hmm. we didn't have like big family reunions and things like that. So a lot of the stuff I put in my books are kind of things that I wish I had, Mm. you know, but kind of like an ideal situation. I see. I'm asking about your family, first of all, because um, it seemed to me at least that you often place your stories uh, or you really root them in the realm of the family Mm -hmm. and of mothers and children, especially maybe, and then use it as a place, you know, in which things converge. There's love and broken dreams. There's ambition there's class, uh, social pressures. There's also political and racialized structures that you know become part of the family's discussions and lives. Um, so maybe could you speak to that? Yeah. So you know, so when I was growing up, uh, a lot of my friends were raised by either their mother or their grandmother. Mm. Um, I was one of the few that had both my mom and my dad, and I had them both till I was seventeen. Um, So, you know, my formative years, I I had my mom and my dad. And I think that, again, you know, a lot of what I do is to go against stereotypes. Hmm. And, you know, again, with African-American TV, movies, literature, the, the dads are almost non-existent. You know, it's always the mom or the grandmother and the kids. Hmm. And so I always wanted to do more ideal situations, you know, like a lot of, there are a lot of authors that are like, oh, this is the way it is. And Mm -hmm. that's completely fine. But I always, in my mind, like to elevate a little bit to show like, you know, instead of kids flunking out of school, what would happen if, you know, they were exceptional students, you know? Mm -hmm. So when kids read it, it's like, okay, it's not that being smart is uncool Mm -hmm. or it's not like hanging out with my dad is uncool or that I have to, you know, have a prison record to Mm -hmm. be cool. That's what being a man is, you know, Mm -hmm. because there's a lot of things in my opinion over the years have gotten really warped uh, as far as what being uh, a a black man is, you know, Mm -hmm. what, being macho is, what being a man is, what, you know, that kind of thing. And I think we've lost kind of like a the sensitivity of like, you know, um, like when I got married and, and my wife and I had kids, I said, listen, I want to be the dad that if they fall down, they can come to me mm-hmm. for a hug and mm-hmm. not just walk past me like, where's mom? You know, and me when their arm is dangling down, <laughs> you know, I was like that that I can be that person also. And I think that that's important. And, um, you know, I've been home with them since I, uh, I think I've been doing this full time for 13 years. Hmm. So I've been home with my sons to, you know, coach T-ball and basketball and, you know, uh, fly kites and go in the backyard and throw burgers on the grill. Uh, Because I think that that's really important. So New Kid starts in the living room of a family as well, the Banks family. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I wondered how you're exploring the theme of family in New Kid. And also in his forthcoming companion, Class Act, you already hinted at some things. And there's, you know, beautiful male characters, actually. And you've mentioned already the grandfather figure. And I think it also, you, you give such a great you know, insight into an emotional world of the father in the story. 
Um, what do you suggest about the connection between who we are and who our family is? Maybe even who our ancestors were. So, you know, the, the whole thing with the African-American family is so multifaceted, right? So, for example, my sons went to school like Jordan Banks did in New Kid, as did I. And a lot of times when teachers would say like, okay, let's do a genealogy project, right? The kids would say, oh, you know, my dad came from Ireland in 1918 and he stopped at Ellis Island and they had this and they could really trace back a lot of their, their history and their genealogy. And, you know, as an African-American here, we didn't have that. You know, uh, it wasn't like a specifically like, oh, we came from Ellis Island, you know, because it, it wasn't by choice. So um, the family unit is very important for me because I know a lot of us had to kind of make stuff up as we went along, you know, um, even, you know, my, uh, my wife and I were like first generation college graduates you know, and my oldest son just graduated from college. So he's second generation. Mm. And, you know, even putting stuff in like um, so many parents in cartoons, even like the Disney cartoons, like one of my biggest fears one day is to grow up as a parent in my next life as a Disney uh, parent in a Disney cartoon, because mm. the worst thing happens, you know, they get mauled by lions and they get blown up and they get a you know, stampeded by, you know, caribou and stuff. And it's like, holy moly, <laughs> you know, I have nightmares of that. Um, and, and I just don't understand why there's, we force so much death on kids at such a young age, you know? So, and I think in uh, African-American literature, there's a lot of that also. So I think that's why, why well, I know that's why in New Kid, I had the whole scene with the grandfather where I kind of set my readers up to expect like, oh, that's grandpa and he's in heaven and he's going to come down and talk to Jordan throughout the book. Because I know that immediately you're like, oh, you know, and then I just kind of twist it to fool people. Um the other thing is where Jordan lives in a brownstone is much different than traditionally, you know, you see um, African-American characters in the projects in the Bronx or in South Central where there's, you know, gang related uh, incidents all the time, things like that. Uh, but I really wanted to have a mom, a dad, you know, a grandfather, you know, neighbors, that whole kind of community Mm -hmm. to show people that we don't always have to accept not having things, you know, like, well, I don't have this, but at least I'm not as bad as, you know, Philip because mm -hmm. Philip's fish just died and mm -hmm. this happened and that. So at least I still have one fish left. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so I just think that that's very important. And, and I try to include that in all of my work. Um, maybe um, for the viewers who have not read the novel yet, um, maybe you could tell us a little more about what, but also about who and which kids uh, New Kid is about. What's the general, you know, story? Yeah, so the, the general story is, um, you know, Jordan Banks is a 12-year-old African-American kid. And he wants to be an artist like how I did. And his parents did not want him to be an artist because they didn't think he'd ever be able to make a living, mm -hmm. uh, much like my parents did. So um, he grew up in Washington Heights, which is mainly an African-American and um, Latino, Latinx community. Mm -hmm. And his parents end up sending him to a prestigious private school in Riverdale section of New York, which is known for his academics, but a lot of the kids are very wealthy. So now he has this not only a fish out of water in his own neighborhood, but a fish out of water going to Riverdale, this fancy school. And, um, you know, he meets one kid named Drew, who is African-American, also from the Bronx. I have my little, the, the back cover here. Oh, so yeah. this is Jordan. Let me see how I can point. Let's, I got to do that. Let's see. There you go. 
Jordan, who is 12, and he's one of the youngest and the smallest in his class, mm -hmm. you know. And Drew, who is African American, is 13. And then here is Liam, who comes from a really wealthy family. Mm -hmm. So it's really about how the three of them, coming from three really different backgrounds, mesh and find what their commonalities are. Right. We, uh, we talked about family in the beginning, and um, there are so interesting conversations going on between Jordan and his mom and his dad, you know, with their different biographies uh, and emotional worlds. And the fact that Jordan starts going to the private school is mostly the decision of his mother, yes. uh, who tells her son, who'd prefer to go to art school because he loves to draw, uh, that in order to be successful in corporate America, he has to know how to play the game. Right. Um, and you have to correct me if I'm wrong, if I'm, you know, over reading this. Uh, I read the game as a certain acknowledgement, not only to, you know, success and ambition, but even the pressure of code switching. Um, was that an underlying theme for you? Oh, absolutely. There's so much code switching. And if anyone does not know what that means, it, it's really a matter of almost being a chameleon, mm. you know? So when you're around your neighborhood, you know, when your friends are all, you know, African American, you have to speak a certain way because you don't want to be like, oh, why do you talk like that? You know, or you think you're all that because you go to this fancy private school. Mm -hmm. So he has to talk like uh, the kids do. Um, then you go to um, a fancy private school where it's predominantly white kids and you can't be that same kid that you were around your block because then they have all different connotations about the kind of person you are. You know, they may naturally think, oh, well, you know, he's tough or he's this, or I bet he's from this single parent household where he just lives with his mom and, you know, his dad is probably incarcerated and this and that because that's what, that's the only thing you see on TV and in the movies. So if you've never actually met a black kid before, you might have those preconceived notions. Mm. Um, I know even now, like as an author, I have gone to schools, you know, about to do this big thing. I'm like, hey, you know, I'm this author and I'm coming in and, you know, they'll take me in this room and I'm like, aren't you here to fix the copier? Mm. And I'm like, no, I'm the author that you have an assembly full of kids waiting to hear me speak. Mm. But because of, you know, how I look, they just naturally assume that it's more of a menial uh, mm -hmm. occupation, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and um, so those are the kinds of things that I want to bring up. So the game really is talking to blending into w mainstream slash white society. Right. You know, how you project yourself. Do they perceive as intelligent? Are you the kind that will get promotions do they do this or you know are they going to keep in the mailroom the rest of your life so that's mm -hmm. kind of what mom was speaking about because she's right. very corporate and um you know we talked about um the grandfather and the father and their emotional worlds and um, jordan in fact you kind of um display and reveal a lot about him through what i found was a quite noticeable element of the novel besides the panels that actually tell the story uh, because you also include pages of jordan's own sketchbook Mm -hmm. uh, that become part of the story. What are what are you doing with that? So the sketchbook was something that um, was really important, and and it was a really a big part of the book. And by showing Jordan's sketches, um, for one, it shows him as a kid, you know, with it, and it it builds up on his artistic abilities and why he wanted to go to art school. But it was another way to really um, have him talk about what he's feeling mm. without it coming off as preachy to the readers. Because again, I'm, I'm so, you know, years of being told that you're angry or you complain too much or things like that. If I had just had Jordan saying, oh, it's hard being one of the few black kids because this, or people assume this, or I know that there will be readers or editors even who would be like, God, all he does is complain. Like, what's what's wrong with him? Why, why is he so angry or so sad? 
but by having it done in cartoon form, he could say more. Mm. And then I could also make it funny so that you don't feel as a reader that I am attacking you, you know, that I'm saying, hey, listen, you know, when you came over and, you know, said like, you know, to the to his dad, like, hey, do you work here? Like, I'm not attacking you, but I'm just saying, you know, as a black man, when I go into a store, a lot of times people would be like, oh, um, can you go in the back and check to see if there are, you know, more of the canned asparagus? I'm like, I don't work here. Um, you know, I'm just like you. So my goal with the comic strips is more someone that, you know, puts his arm around you and goes, hey, Philip, you know, when you do this, I know you mean well. But this is why it's a little insulting as opposed to just chastising you and then you just shut down. Right. You know, right. so it, it was that kind of uh, impact that I was hoping for. Yeah. And it works out very well, I thought. And I even thought, you know, through the sketchbook, it's the, the whole novel is also such a beautiful tribute to drawing and graphic novels themselves. There's a kind of, you know, decl love declaration <laughs> in some ways uh, to, the, to the genre that you're working in. Yeah. Um, uh, you assess um, African American life with a deep sensibility, to me at least, for not only a twelve-year-old boy, but also his quotidian life. Uh, and you already spoke to, you know, how you brought in your own experiences, the experiences of your own children. Um, so this twelve-year-old boy and this contemporary experience of racism in New York City. And uh, you expressed before that books by African American authors often relate to slavery to civil rights, um, to police brutality. And you said that anytime you find something that doesn't involve those, you're happy. Um, yeah. And there is in fact an optimistic tone in your book, I think, that you reach much through likable characters and humor. There's also this tone of um, overcoming of struggles, a personal av awakening or, or a transformation. I wondered how difficult it is to write optimistically. Well, um... In 2020, <laughs> it is hard to do anything optimistically. Um, but I know that it's important because it does really change lives. You know, like one of the things that I do is like when I do school visits, I will say, okay, name, you know, a black character from literature, TV, movies, you know, who you like and that you consider like a friend, you know, like that kind of thing. Um, you know, like who's a household name, like a Charlie Brown, a Harry Potter, a wimpy kid, you know, that kind of thing. And there's usually crickets, you know, and kids are like, oh yeah. You know, like there is, oh, you know, the one that's the best friend of the book. And I'm like, yeah, but I mean, as a star, like a, a protagonist, not a sidekick. Hmm. And in 2020, it is very unsettling that there isn't a Greg Heffley, a Charlie Brown, you know, that kind of thing. You know, when I was a kid, we had Fat Albert, but that was 50 years ago, you know, as far as a character that made it to the mainstream and, you know, T-shirts and book bags and lunch boxes, that kind of thing. And it's weird that as successful as that was, that nothing has taken its place. So even capitalism, you know, of like, hey, we can make money doing this, uh, wasn't strong enough to do that. Hmm. So that's why I'm I'm honored uh, that New Kid has not only had the critical success with the Newberry and Credit Scott King and the Kirkus, but has had. Um, you know, commercial success. Mm. Um, and I, you know, I just always wanted to be like, well, I told you so. Like, if you just give us in uh, the opportunity, you know, I didn't expect any more or any, I didn't expect any more of an opportunity. But if I was given the same opportunity, I just thought that I could do this. And mm. to, to see it reflected in the, you know, New York Times bestseller list. And, you know, I've had kids from New Zealand, 
you know, FaceTime me and, uh, you know, a little white girl from Iowa saying, I relate to Jordan Banks because kids do that. You know, kids are kids. Kids are like, oh, I'm just like him. You know, it's the parents that grow up and like, oh, no, I'm not buying you that book because there's a little black kid on the cover. or I'm not buying you the black doll because that's not who you are. Mm -hmm. But um, as an African-American, I grew up watching and relating to white characters on TV. Like, hey, I'm Greg Brady. Hey, I'm so-and-so Partridge. Hey, I'm Charlie Brown. So I think that's why a lot of times African-Americans can write white characters better than white authors can write black characters because you really don't know a lot of the nuances of what our life is. You just know what you think you see from TV. Mm. Um, I think from what you're saying also about the optimism, but even how you, you know, set out the novel and the story, uh, it seems to me that you wanted to produce a literature for young people, for young black people that is not focused on trauma. Mm. Um, and you're really, I feel, giving a different model here that uh, in fact, critiques the pessimism of focusing too much on the traumatic history uh, of racism in the U.S. that, you know, suggests that every black boy that a teacher sees is a trauma. Um, yeah. uh, I also think you don't reject the traumatic history, but what is the power of giving more attention to, if I may say so, normalcy to the everyday? Oh, no, you're absolutely right. Um, I saw a teacher on Twitter not too long ago said that, um, you know, they're talking about, you know, what you want to be when you grow up. And like the one black kid says something like, oh, well, if I live to be 18, I would like to do blah, blah, blah. Hmm. And it just hit her like a ton of bricks. But, you know, if all you ever see, like every movie when I was a kid, if it was about a kid who got accepted into college, right? Literally, like, as he has the envelope in his hand, some guy whose foot he stepped on in the beginning of the movie comes and shoots him. And then the whole ending is the leather falling slowly to the ground. Mm -hmm. And then it opens up and the mother comes over and opens up like, my baby got into Harvard. Now he's getting into heaven. And then the credits roll. I'm like, that's not a happy ending. <laughs> Like, what are you doing here? Mm -hmm. And um, it's just, it's just that I I feel like er so many of the books and movies, like if there is building up to something happy, boom. And I feel like with mainstream slash white movies, if there is a horrific event, it happens in the beginning, and it's all about how the character builds up and finds happiness again. Right. And I feel with a lot of the black literature in movies, it starts happy and it ends with death. Mm -hmm. You know, so you really don't leave the theater going, wow, that was fun. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, uh you're leaving with tears in your eyes and and you just don't ever expect to be happy. Mm. And um you know, I've gotten so many emails from teachers and librarians, and I know we're going to show this, the comic strip that I did in the book, of how it has changed their opinion on how they see kids of color, specifically African-American boys and girls. Right. And maybe that's a perfect moment also. We wanted to um, give a little impression of one little part of the book, um, uh, which, uh, um, you know, because I think... Uh, uh, your exploration of the nuances of race and class, the space of the school um, and the field of education play a really big role. And that scene, which takes part um, at a book fair that Jordan and his friends are visiting, uh, kind of reveals a lot about that. Also, what you've just touched on. So um, our producer is Joe. If, Joe, if you could please um, just uh, show us also the cover of New Kid, which we haven't seen yet, um, uh, and switch to that. And then, uh, Jerry, if you could just walk us through this um, scene a little bit and how oh, it faded into the story. <clears throat> so this is so one of the things is I, I never had book fairs when I was a kid. 
you know, and so many uh, kids now and people I know grew up with the Scholastic Book Fair and they ran to get books. And I was never, it was almost like I was in a book desert. You know, right. the, the library in my neighborhood was closed all the time. I didn't have bookstores. I didn't have this. So when I see the pure joy that kids have of going to these book fairs, it's just absolutely amazing. Mm. Um, so in this particular one, um, they're talking about books and there's Jordan. So you can go to the next uh, slide because you you're showing the cover now. There you go. So it's Jordan, Drew, and Liam. And Jordan's like, hey, you guys get anything good? And they talk about, uh, Liam says, oh, yeah, I'm going to pick up the new wimpy kid for Grayson. He's homesick today. And Drew's like, man, I used to love those. Oh, me too. What about Percy Jackson? Yep, read every single one. But I just don't see a lot that interests me anymore. I miss that. Me too. Now I just get books on how to draw. So in the foreground, at the bottom, you have African-American escapist literature. So a lot of literature is escapist. But escapist is like, oh, Harry Potter, I'm going to escape from my mundane life and I'm going to rescue a princess from a dragon or I'm going to, you know, go into the stars. I'm going to do this. But a lot of the escapist uh, literature for African-Americans, I have escape from gang life, escape from slavery, escape from poverty, escape from prison. You know, those kind of things. And then the librarian comes over and uh, she goes, boys, I picked out the perfect books for you. Real books, Alex, not those silly graphic comics. And Maury, this book has won all the major awards for African-American literature. So the white kid, Alex, gets the magic of the magical magic con, a magical adventure. And Maury, the black kid, gets the mean streets of South Uptown. A gritty tale of survival. You're really going to identify with Dayquell, the protagonist. He suffered so much growing up in poverty without a father. And he goes, um, thanks, Miss Brickner, but my dad is the CEO of a Fortune 500 company. And she's actually a little disappointed. She's like, oh, hmm. Drew? <laughs> um, so then I show Jordan's sketchbook. So the next slide will actually show um the comic that Jordan did and it's judging kids by the covers of their books so mainstream books the magic of the magical magic kind of magical adventure african american books the mean streets of south uptown mainstream book covers cool colorful illustrations full of magic and hope african american book covers a depressing photograph full of realism and hopelessness mainstream book plots Prince Amai leaves his dull life to slay a dragon, rescue Princess Brea, and prove to his father that one day he'll make a worthy king. African-American book plots. After moving to his third city in three years, Dayquell Scooter Jackson must decide if he will pursue his dreams of being in the NBA or join a notorious street gang. Hmm. And then uh, you have a triumph for the white book and gritty hmm. <laughs> for the black book. Mainstream book heroes lives in the magical kingdom. Black heroes lives in the hood. White lives in a stable home. Lives in a broken home. Wants to live better. Just wants to live. Hmm. White books. His father's king. His father's gone. And then finally, the reviews. A thrilling magical tale that's sure to inspire readers of all ages to never give up until they have found the treasure they seek. School library journal. And the black book. A gritty urban reminder of the grit of today's urban grittiness, Jet Magazine. So there you have it. <laughs> right. So, you know, I got the most interesting feedback. Um, there was a woman, um, a librarian who went on Twitter and he, she said, you know, I really like New Kid, but I'm disappointed in Jerry Craft a little bit because when he showed the librarian, that was his opportunity to show a woman who's willing to help and this and that and this and that, right? And so many people, all the librarians were like, you know what? I understand what you're saying, but I am that librarian and I had no idea that I was that librarian. Mm. One woman said there was a, a black girl who had read The Hate You Give and loved it 
and came to her and said, do you have anything else like this? And she gave her all these other like police brutality and gang books and stuff like that. And she realized, she said, you know what? She didn't want a book on violence. What she liked about The Hate You Give was that the protagonist star was a smart African-American girl who used her mind and, and intellect to solve problems. Mm. So she realized that by always giving the gritty, urban grittiness books that she was doing her kids a disservice. Mm. Because not only is that what black kids think that that's all that they can attain themselves, but that's all that white kids think. You know, mm. it's like, well, you know, why even go to school where eventually you're just going to join a gang and end up in jail anyway? Mm. You know? I, I found that scene so um, interesting because um, I read it as a critique you know, not only of the book market, but also of schooling and education um, mm -hmm. through this idea of whiteness and this phenomenon of well-meaning white liberals uh, that is present throughout the novel with teachers. Um, because these, to me, these white liberals who are giving out these books are a very specific critique, um, you know, of teachers, um, of maybe librarians who see young black boys and they kind of See, seem to see a problem to be fixed, or they see themselves as saviors um, who tend to read black experience through black people as eternal victims, maybe. Um, yeah. And I, I have to say, I was really struck by this manifestation of white liberalism. So I don't know, maybe that goes too far, but maybe you could speak a little bit more about your take on this, you know, on this, on these people on US American liberalism and how it is specific through race. Well, you know what's so interesting is, um, my father uh, once told me the story of him being in Port Arthur, Texas, and he is thirsty, so he stops and he drinks out of a water fountain. And these people start screaming at him, and he looks up and it says white only. So he has to literally run because he mistakenly um, drank out of a, a white drinking fountain. Mm. Okay, that's my father, you know, not my great, great, great grandfather in Mississippi in 1850. This is my dad. So mm -hmm. I am one generation removed from that. And I think that historically, you know, we think of things that happened that long ago, but it's not that long ago, mm -hmm. you know, and a lot of, so if this is uh, my dad, then a lot of the um, the white uh, parents, librarians, teachers are the offspring of the people who put those signs up in the first place. Hmm. You know, so that's that's all they know. That's as good as we can do in one generation. Mm -hmm. You know, so you either have people who overcompensate and try to make up for that or you have people who still feel that way that you know we're you know um you know my kids are better than your kids that kind of thing but there's not enough people listening right you know like what do you need you know because even when i went to a school like riverdale um in the book it was more like you know, you're so happy to be here. This is such a great opportunity. So just suck it up and do what you have to do, but not realizing, hey, maybe you need to talk to someone because, you know, you have a book that, you know, your teacher gives you here, read this, but, you know, there are kids, even um, last year, we wanted to give a, a black kid a copy of my book and he's like, hey, you know, Miss So and so, I really appreciate that and everything, but I can't be walking my neighborhood with no book. Right. You mm -hmm. know, and if you don't understand that, then maybe the reason he doesn't do his homework is because he's afraid to be seen with books in his neighborhood. Mm -hmm. So maybe have, you know, talk to him, say, hey, well, what's going on? Mm -hmm. Okay, maybe you could stay after school, we'll give you a classroom. And you can do your homework here instead, you know, um, and then to 
you know, very rarely, I think, are, you know, white Americans or, you know, just in general, ever in a room with 300 black people, mm. you know, and if they are, you can't say that you wouldn't be uncomfortable. It would take a special person not to be uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. But that's my entire life. You know, mm -hmm. if I go to, you know, one of these big conventions, there are literally 10,000 people there. There might be 10 African Americans, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. um, so to have to always go in and out, like, it doesn't bother me now, but I've had, you know, my whole life of experience doing that. But imagine being the other way around. Right. You right. know, so now as an adult, I'm okay with it. But if you're a 12 year old and, you know, you get invited to all your white friends' houses, but no one wants to come to your house, you know, you start to feel those things differently. And I just don't think that enough people take that into consideration, you know, and it's very easy to just say, oh, well, your son is antisocial or he doesn't reach out or he doesn't do this. You know, it's because that's just how it is. There's so many intricacies and nuances and you can't make rules and curriculum and different things like that without actually talking and say, hey, Jerry, what is it that you need for your kids? Mm, you know? Right. And that's one of the things that I wanted to kind of bring out. Again, not condemning everyone because, you know, the people who try to help, I mean, thank God. Yes. Thank you. Mm. But, um, you know, just so that's why I had like Coach Roach in there where he's always everything he says is like, is that racist? It, right. It, right. You know, it, you know, okay, am, was that all right? Or is that mm -hmm. just have more dialogue in, in open forums, you know? Mm -hmm. So uh, very soon on October 6th, New Kids Companion Class Act will be published. Yes. So could you tell us a little bit more about what interested you in this continuation of Jordan's life, what your take will be, and maybe also how the graphics shifted? So, you know, it's so interesting because I feel like, I'm a much better artist and writer now than I was even when I did New Kid because I, I just put so much work. I definitely did my 10,000 hours of, you know, drawing. So um, I just felt like my mind was just exploding with ideas. And I definitely wanted, like initially the talk with my publisher was that the second book should be totally different. You know, it could still be in a new kid universe or realm, but not necessarily a continuation. Mm. And I really was strong on the idea of having the next chapter. I thought having a companion book was important because I wanted to continue the story of Jordan, Drew, and Liam, because my goal all along was to build iconic African-American characters, which you never see, really. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if one day they're at lunchboxes and, you know, Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade float or something like that, and, you know, white kids aspiring to be Jordan Banks, um, that, I think, just solves so much, you know, because you never really see it both ways like that. Right. Both books, but especially Class Act. And um, Joe, if we could also maybe briefly show the cover of Class Act, because we haven't done that yet as I'm, as I'm um, talking. Uh, both books are also homages to many authors of color and the art of comic writing. Uh, I don't think we'll have time to talk about it, but there are many cross references, which I think is really cool and a lot of fun Easter eggs. Um, in which I think you show how you're connected to, you know, many people who are in the comic world, but also uh, in uh, in uh, other kind of prose fiction, mm -hmm. uh, et cetera. So I think that'll be um, uh, a really, you know, a kind of enriching read as well. Once yeah, it I, I love Easter eggs. So there, right. there are a ton of them in there. Um, so Jerry, as you love to draw, I thought I'd give you the opportunity to end our conversation with a drawing. Um, and of course you're allowed to talk, but uh, maybe you can answer one last question uh, with a drawing. Okay. I tried to make it, make it a little bit difficult and I think you can um, set up your screen sharing 
um, as I'm telling you the question, maybe. Yeah. Um, if you like, if you look at the, uh, you know, if you look at how the the graphic form of your work plays out with its themes of school, of class, and race, of friendship and family, why does the graphic novel work so well? What what is it about that visual genre that makes stories so powerful? Um, so, you know, the biggest thing is when they talk about a picture being worth a thousand words, you know, mm. so there is one scene in the book where Jordan is in the cafeteria and I have this kind of thing where you have him and, you know, now if this were a prose book, I could say, okay, and Jordan walks in and he's got his, you know, his tray and this kind of thing. But by showing that, you know, you got this and then I have this gigantic foot coming, you know, like this, and you really get a sense of how small he feels. You know, there's like a little container of milk on the ground here, this kind of thing. And there might be like a French fry or something like that. So when you see this kind of thing, you know, I don't even have to go in and say, oh, I feel small and insignificant and I feel this. It's just like you see this kind of thing and then everyone talking with their friends. So now he's very isolated and this is like, pow, you know, it just, I think just comes right out at you. Mm. Wonderful. So um, thank you. I mean, I, thank you for, um, you know, making that case for powerful stories, for powerful visuals. Uh, and for talking about what also a socially committed, you know, graphic novel literature can do for us today, especially uh, in this political moment. Absolutely. Um, so Jerry, uh, you once um, wrote um, a short comic for the New York Times, and I'm going to end with this, uh, in which you told the story of a young boy and his love for comics versus books that to him are labor. And with this little story and its pile of comic book words in mind, uh, I'll say that, uh, uh, that I um, greatly enjoyed this spectacularly galactic, uh, astonishingly cosmic and thoughtful <laughs> and thankfully non-apocalyptic conversation with you. Uh, thank you so much, nice. Jerry. Me too. <laughs> um, and, this, this is amazing. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, and to you, all our viewers, uh, it was so kind of you to spend some time with us today. Please make sure to check out Jerry Craft's work, New Kid and its companion Class Act are both published by HarperCollins and Class Act will go on sale on October 6th. You will find it in any offline or online bookstore uh, that you like to frequent. Um, please also make sure to take a look at the program of Berlin's 20th International Literature Festival, which you can find online. Thank you for joining us today. May you all be safe and well.